what we see here is map of the Indian Ocean and right there is where the Burkle Crater was found. Its depth is 12,500 feet down. Mm. The dating of this puts it right around 5,000 years ago. And the effects of it are these gigantic chevrons which are seismic sea wave or tsunami deposits. And this is what they look like, chevrons, and from the ground they look like this. If you go here, and you'll see the chevrons are the V-shaped, and for example here is a nice <clears throat> elegant V-shape. And they're pointing, basically what we're seeing is the onrush of water onto the land this way, and then it's draining back off. That's what we're seeing, that's how these, you see if it was a, a, a uniform flow in one direction, it creates those nice current ripples with parallel bands and so forth. Here what we see is the current ripples have been, um, you know, moved and essentially smeared into this chevron-like shape. And this is what a chevron looks like from the ground. They're 600 feet, this would be the point of one of the V's, and they're 600 feet thick. And if you recall the story, when this broke last fall, and I brought this in, mm -hmm. what was interesting about these was because they had all the earmarks of water laid deposits, when they took core samples inside the chevrons, they discovered that there were deep sea microfossils, and that the microfossils were extant species, that means species that are alive today, but the most unique thing about them was fused to these microfossils was extraterrestrial metal. These were microfossils, by the way, that were known to exist on the floor of the ocean. Deep sea microfossils. So here they have these giant chevron water-shaped deposits with deep sea microfossils and fused with those microfossils are the extraterrestrial metals that is the sure indicator of something extraterrestrial. Oh. Where are these chevrons? These chevrons are found along the coast of Madagascar, right there. Right. So what they did was they said, well, could a earthquake have produced a tsunami with a minimum run-up height of 600 feet? The thickness of the chevrons is an indication of the minimum height of the tsunami wave as it, as it hit land. So the chevrons are 600 feet thick. That means that the, sh that the wave was probably even several hundred feet higher than that when it hit land, when it made landfall. So they thought, well, it's most likely then that such a wave should have registered itself over on the west coast of Australia. So when they looked on the west coast of Australia, what did they begin finding? Do you see it? It's well, can you see it? Look at it. Here it is, all the stuff. When the wave hit, you can see the stuff that was just splooged. That's the scientific term. <laughs> the, stuff was, the stuff was in the wave, or the wave? Yeah, the set stuff was in the wave. <clears throat> This is a backwash course, treated. Yeah, and then of course once it hit land, it probably... All we got to do is remember the video footage of the great uh, tsunami from a couple of years ago. Yeah. And you remember you, how the wave came in and just kept moving like a river, moving mm -hmm. inland and upstream and how much stuff it carried with it. And then when it flowed back out, it just dropped a lot of this stuff sediment and trash and trees and corpses and everything just in heaps and piles. But there's a closer up view of it and you can see pretty clearly what you're looking at is giant sea wave deposits that hit land probably moving a hundred miles an hour and were somewhere between 600 and a thousand feet high when they hit. India got some too? Well, is that land the studies hell? that I have not been able to find studies on India yet. It, okay, so there's India. The wave of course, would have radiated outwards from this impact point, and waves would have moved this way up here. So, if anything, it wouldn't have hit India broadside. It would have been deflected off this point. Now, would seem like studies on that island. What's that island right there? Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Is that Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka? Yeah. 
Okay, so maybe studies of Sri Lanka would be worth doing. Um, you know, maybe studies up in here, but, well, we're getting to that. Uh, here's the thing. This is research that any person in this room can do by going to Google Earth and starting, okay, pick the coastline of South Africa there. Start going over with Google Earth, or what's the other one? Virtual Earth. Yeah. And start looking at them. That's how I found those. I mean, I read about them in the literature and where they were supposed to be. So I went to Google Earth and began looking. And sure enough, they were, you know, there they were, as clear as, clear as anything. So they then, uh, based upon the direction of the chevrons, the chevrons are directional indicators. See, you can tell from studying a chevron which direction the current came from. And so that's how they located the epicenter. They didn't know there was anything on the bottom of the ocean. But what they did was by studying the deposits hmm. on Australia and Madagascar, showing that they seemed to emanate from a point in the Indian Ocean, they went there and they began doing studies of the ocean floor, and right at that spot they found the 12 and a half, the 12 mile hole in the bottom of the floor. Mm. And the dating of the sediments in the chevrons was dated at around five and less than 6,000 years ago. Mm. Now, How deep was the crater in the ocean floor? Well, it's filled with sediment because most likely as it penetrated the ocean, it would have created a transient cavity that would have expanded outwards hit the ocean bottom, gouged the floor, and then as the water rushed back in, it brings all of this stuff back in. So it, to my knowledge, at this point, not enough studies have been done to determine the actual, the real depth of the crater because it's almost certainly filled up to a large extent with backwash sediment. Um, you wouldn't fill it at the point that they weren't sure, of it. They, they knew it was a crater. Pretty much, I mean, the circularity of it and everything is totally consistent, and an up, up raised rim and everything is totally consistent. What year was it discovered? About within the last two years. Okay, so well, I remember that being 18 miles wide. Yeah, or 17 and a half. I thought so it was, was it 18 kilometers. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, I think it was 18 oh, okay. kilometers. Okay. But okay, I mean, a 12, I mean, good Lord. I mean, do you know what a 12 <laughs> mile crater event would do? What that would imply for if it happened now? A big splash. Well, and that's at the bottom. That's that wide of a crater that deep down. Yeah, that deep down. Yeah. That deep down, that's the big thing. Not like a cushion the water. wall. Well, then that gets us to something else. No, this is something that, you know, we've never seen something like this, obviously, in real life. Or, you know humans probably did 5,000 years ago. And I had I intended to bring it tonight, but I wasn't able to get my fingers on it. There's, we, Remember the Holocene Working Group? We talked about oh, yeah. it last fall when I introduced this, when this stuff first came out. Somebody within the Holocene Working Group has been working on this, and they have concluded that when this event happened, perhaps up to 80% of the global population of that time mm -hmm. died as a result of this event. Now I'm going to go to an article that was written by a geologist back around the turn of the century who had been analyzing the story of Noah's Flood and the story of Utnapishtim's Flood, which was in the Sumerian and Assyrian accounts. And as a result of studying those, he came to some interesting conclusions. 